So this is uh, Alex Howard from O'Reilly Media, uh, reporting from the Government 2.0 Expo here in Washington, D.C. I have with me Kate Lundy, federal senator from Canberra, Australia. Uh, she spoke this morning. It was a keynote here, and uh, she was kind enough to join us and uh, take time away from her meetings and exploring Washington. Thanks, so Alex. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, so you spoke about a number of things this morning. Uh, one was a legislative change that will affect how Government 2.0 goes forward in Australia. What, what's happening there? Well, two pieces of legislation passed our Senate just a, a couple of weeks ago. The first one was our Freedom of Information uh, Act. It's a series of amendments that upgrade uh, the, the way in which the government has to release information. But most importantly for me was a, a new objective which says the default position of government should be to release public information or information collected by agencies unless there's a compelling security privacy reason not to. So the case has to be made not to release it, not the other way around. Interesting. And when you say release, you mean release online? Release online is the, the seen as the primary vehicle. Um, and then if people would want to print off that, that that's fine. But it's about digitizing it, making it available online. Uh, Alex, I should mention the other piece of legislation. Please. Um, the Information Commissioner. This is important because it creates a new statutory position that um, of a person, an information commissioner, that will handle all of the really big picture information management issues for the federal government in Australia. Mm. So it's a, an overarching policy position, I suppose a little bit analogous to you know the, the chief government CIO, mm. but broader because it looks not just at tech, you know, IT related issues, but the public policy surrounding them and getting I think the specifications right for what government is trying to achieve through their technology use. So that comes together at the same time that this government 2.0 task force has released recommendations and then the Australian government has responded to them. Uh, what are those yeah. recommendations and what's the response been like? Yeah, um, the Gov 2.0 task force report, um, it was a very eloquent set of recommendations. I think a solid blueprint for Australia going forward and many of the, the government accepted the recommendations. And importantly, has, uh, the government has uh, foreshadowed a significant role for the Information Commissioner. So that the timing, you know, usually in politics this doesn't happen. The timing's perfect. Mm. So we've just got the legislation through, the government's responded to the task force, the role has been created and the capacity now to proceed forthwith with implementation. So for the task force, uh, two main areas of recommendations making government data open and available, so releasing that. And secondly, the issues of culture and attitude within the public sector. What do we need to do within the Australian public service to make it um, have greater capacity to innovate, to be less risk averse, to try new things with, with the, the tools that are in the cloud already, um, to create a joined up government online, all those kinds of challenges. So uh, we just recently rebooted data.gov here in the U.S. Uh, yeah. Tim Berners-Lee uh, spoke this morning about open link data, has been working hard on data.gov.uk. Uh, yeah. Should we expect the data.gov.au Yeah, we, soon? we're already there. Already we're there. Already, we've got um, data.gov.au, okay. um, and it's the, the repository, as you would imagine, for data sets to be released. Mm -hmm. I've, I've talked extensively previously about the the, the sort of technical aspects of, of what data should, how, how data should be released. Mm -hmm. um, and things like, you know, open standards and usability and, and open formats are all important. And we're, we're learning along the way. Um, we had a mashup event as part of the Gov 2.0 task force process. And uh, I think that was the, um, really the launch pad for data.gov.au. Okay. And you said, I mentioned uh, mashups. Can people find some of those mashups online? Uh, they can. If you go to um, the gov2.net.au website, which is the task force website, and follow through to the Mashup Australia, or GovHack, as we call it. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a dangerous word sometimes. People are you know, careful yeah, around yeah, that one. Look, but it, 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 it certainly is. And it was um, the same week that GovHack um, was announced to the world. I think our security agencies issued a cyber terrorism briefing. So it was kind of... I think it helps the media around GovHack. Sure. Well, I guess it creates some attention. Uh, yeah. One of the uh, open formats, too, that's been adopted by Australian government is Creative Commons. What's yeah. happening there? Okay. Well, Creative Commons is a, a permissive um, licensing regime that allows people to use material 
and the, the BY license, the CC BY license is by attribution license. So for the first time ever, and this was a recommendation of the task force, uh, we've had um, our budget papers released under Creative Commons. And I think even more significantly, the whole of the Australian Parliamentary website, yeah. um, it's being re reworked, at the, remodelled at the moment, will be under Creative Commons. So yeah. Senate committees, um, the transcripts, the submissions, the reports, all of the information about how our democracy functions um, in, in our federal parliament is, is held on this website. And that's all going to be out there. Um, under the CCBY license, which is great. So that's a tremendous amount of change in a fairly short amount of time in terms of how government is releasing information and what it uh, is expecting from or uh, and how it's empowering the community of developers and citizens. Uh, how is that changing the relationship between government and the people that it is uh, representing? Mm. Uh, look, I think it's... Citizens for a long time have... Um, it, it's just a an exercise in frustration interacting with government and, and everyone knows it's like well how, how hard was it as opposed to how easy was it. So we think that with the, the raft of online innovation that's occurring and making government data more accessible that that attitude hopefully will start to be okay this is more of a, a conversation and exchange and an interaction but we need to do it in a way that empowers citizens so it doesn't feel like we're creeping all around their lives online now. Um, and, and the australia.gov.au websites are a good example of how the citizen can release as much information as they want and have services in their area tailored um, to their needs delivered back to them. They don't have to give their name, just their station in life, you know, kids, married, live in this suburb, need to know health information or whatever. Um, or they could give their personal information and have a direct interaction with the agencies and departments participating. It's, it's, it's elegant because agencies and departments can opt in when they're ready. So we have not all agencies participating in Australia.gov, but that will come. It also has the potential for state and local government services to be brought into that environment as well, so I'm really excited about it. Uh, one of the challenges that you've talked about here in the United States as you move uh, towards more online services, more e-government, more open government, um, is that it potentially can exacerbate the existing digital divide. If you can't yeah. get online, then you can't tap into all the resources. And I know that's an issue all around the rest of the world, too. Um, now, Australia has recently uh, pushed forward the a national broadband plan of its own and is looking at digital divide issues. So how yeah. big is uh, an issue is that there, and what are you doing to address it? Well, up until our policy for the National Broadband Network, everything I would say about government online was qualified with the fact that we would have a dual mode of service delivery, and we still will for generations to come. But in the absence of a plan to close the digital divide, there was a qualification and an acknowledgement that we were creating another division in society. Um, the National Broadband Network has changed all that. It's a, a, a huge policy, up to $43 billion worth of investment it's a, a wholesale only, open access, fibre to the home, fibre to the premises network reaching 93% of the population, the next 3% on uh, terrestrial wireless, and then the final 3% on, um, final 2%, 4%. I think it's 4, yeah, final 4, four yeah, right in there. <laughs> um, on satellite, with, mm -hmm. but the new KA band is that, right. is that comes out. Australia, big enough as it is, you have to have at least some small amount through satellite. Yeah, There's and no we have this it. really... Yeah you know, dispersed population too. Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be a percentage that requires satellite. But it's, the 93% is, is, is 100 megabits service. Mm. Um, the 3% the for terrestrial wireless is, you know, guaranteed 12, 12 megabits per second service. So we're talking about pretty fat pipes compared to what we're used to, you know, struggling along with 512 ADSL. It's pretty poor at the moment. You know, incumbent and their monopolistic behaviour. So we've done the hard yards. So our telco policy, I would argue, is intimately related to our Gov 2.0 vision. Mm -hmm. Without that broadband policy, um, I, I, I think it's hard to say this is, would be an inclusive um, um, you know, challenge for Gov 2.0, but we can say that now because we are investing in those connections uh, right around the country. So I'm incredibly proud of that. We're one of the few countries, I think, that has a grip on the, um, um, the necessary public policy on, on telecommunications industry structure 
and regulatory environment and an independent regulatory environment to actually achieve this outcome. Well, there's considerable wrangling right here in D.C. about precisely this issue as yeah. our own uh, Federal Communications Commission yeah. uh, deals with the issue of broadband plan and net neutrality. So uh, I'll be watching from far across the ocean to see how are you all doing it. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Alex. It's uh, Kate Lundy. She's a federal senator from Canberra, Australia. You can find more information about her at katelundy.com.au or follow her on Twitter at, eight, at Kate Lundy. Thank you very much.